Queen Actually, Andrea. I'm great. Welcome. Thank you for joining Thanks. us at the Museum of the Graffiti. I'm uh, excited also that you guys are going to be able to open again soon. Yeah. It, it, you know, again, it's a slow, slow process, slow and careful and deliberate process. You know, we want to take care of ourselves and everyone that comes to visit us. Yeah. Um, uh, again, you know, trying to stay on course and on mission. And it, of course, part of it's not just interior. We have all the exterior stuff that we share with people because we're in Wynwood, of course, because of all these murals. Um, so, Andrea, before I, I get started, I want to read a paragraph of your bio to everyone so they're familiar with you. Um, uh, so, uh, Andrea von Boydash, a.k.a. Queen Andrea, hails from New York City and is a fine artist, graffiti writer, typographer, and designer who grew up in Manhattan, New York City, and has been inspired by urban life from an early age. QA is a New York-based graffiti artist who is a diehard native New Yorker, and she's been deeply inspired by the landscape of New York City. Her style is consistently marked by, by excuse me, marked by a bold use of color, design, and advanced typography. As a young teen, part of her, a newer generation of early 1990s graffiti writers, she befriended some of the most prolific old school subway writers and diligently taught herself the complicated art form of graffiti by consistently practicing her letters and eventually developing her own unique style. She earned a BFA in graphic design and began a successful career working for worldwide brands who appreciate her versatile and passionate knowledge of typography, branding, and visual communication. Her work has directly impacted graffiti, streetwear, and urban culture, and Andrea has spent nearly 20 years perfecting her graffiti and typography skill sets and is now an internationally notable female graffiti artist and muralist. That you are, you are rather accomplished and, and continue to, you know, uh, push into new directions for visual arts. And, uh, you know, and I, I say that very broadly in terms of communication design, not just graffiti design. So let's just start from the beginning uh, because you have this really amazing beginning in your story in New York. And you, you, you were, were raised in Soho of all places. Yeah, so I was raised in Soho. So my uh, family were artists. Uh, my parents were artists, but you know, not bougie. We lived in a loft. It wasn't that fancy. Um, but at the time in Manhattan at that time in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was really getting into this, the downtown scene was just amazing. I mean, the 90s was really the golden age, I think, of hip hop. Um, there was skateboarding happening, there was punk music, there were raves, and, you know, more importantly for me, there was a lot of graffiti. Um, it had not uh, become a felony until the, like, in, in the early 90s, so there, it was rampant, and it was beautiful. Um, so I was just, I was fully inspired. I, you know, it was a great time, and I wanted to be a part of it somehow. I, you know, started hanging out with, um, actually, you know, before, even in junior high school, I loved scribbling my name in my school notebooks. Like, I was always drawn to that, even at 12, 13 years old. And my, my old school papers are full of these, like, little tags that I would create for myself, um, you know, way back in the day. And, um, and then I, I started to get into the mix, you know, hanging out in my neighborhood and, I met writers and, and um, you know, we, we, you know, did vandalism and went out at night and all these things and I was hanging out. Um, and I kind of realized that it was a, a very rough lifestyle and I wanted to do something more with it somehow. So I quickly learned on my commute to school, I went to Bronx Science and I was taking the four train up to the Bronx every day. And I was seeing so much graffiti um, on rooftops and big, huge production walls. And I started to realize that there was another aspect of it where I could, you know, do colorful pieces and, and learn letters and, and somehow become like a style master and, you know, not get so caught up with, um, you know, vandalism, which is great and which, which I love and still to this day excites me in so many ways because, 
you know, it's not easy. And there's some people out there who are, you know, true kings and queens. They're so passionate about it. I mean, it's it's such an incredible um, outlaw art that, you know, should be recognized. And, you know, thank you, Museum of Graffiti, for, for doing that for us. So I wanted to try and take it to another level. And so I started to just learn letters um, constantly. So this photo here was on Canal Street. This was 1993. Um, and we somehow, like, uh, got a, a, a permission from this business called Uncle Steve. I don't know if some people remember that business. I do. And yeah. And so, you know, and then I, I just started, you know, learning. And at the beginning, everybody is, you know, really bad. And especially in the late 80s, early 90s, this was also when graffiti was coming off the trains and it was on the streets. And like everyone was, you know, figuring out how do we do this, you know, and that was the birth of street bombing. Um, and there are just so many people that inspired me, certain crews like you know, Cat's Crew, Riss, and um, XTC, you know, AOK, TFP are my, my favorite, you know, peace crews of all time. So there was just a lot happening. There was a lot of inspiration. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned to me that Cat had, was working in the neighborhood, so you had a direct connection with him when, uh, at a very early age. Yeah, so I actually, I lived on Grand Street. That's where I grew up, right by uh, Lucky Strike. And also right across the street from Henry Chaffant's studio. And um, that's yeah, me. I just put a photo of that up. That's me in my bedroom there. <laughs> and this is and this is the street where I grew up. So um, that parking lot is now full of, you know, a, a big building, you know, some bougie, <laughs> you know, it's, probably, it's a great building, I'm sure. But it, this used to be a parking lot where like a lot of people would tag up. Um, and that's where I did one of my first pieces. Um, so Henry Chiffon studio is across the street. Carl Weston, who did videograph, was also across the street. So there was a lot of amazing um, history happening there. Carl Weston, as people might not know, um, his series of videograph basically followed some of the most notorious bombers in New York City um, doing their thing. And it's like, you know, the most amazing real live uh, historical documentation of that movement. So if anyone, you know, can find those, I don't know if he, what he's doing now, but so it was, it was incredible. And I feel very grateful to have started, you know, um, at that time and in this neighborhood where things were really popping off. Yeah, and what's interesting at that time as well, it, it was very active with art galleries as well. And of course, there was the downtown scene um, yeah. that was happening. And I love this photograph of you because uh, all the flyers are in the background. Uh, Giant Step, for instance. And, yeah. all, you know, it, it, it's really exciting to be a kid and have this energy, this New York energy uh, right outside your doorstep. Yeah, it was very important. And it wasn't only graffiti, it was uh, skating, there were still a lot of raves happening. Um, you know, of course, hip hop, you know, early streetwear, I mean, like early fat farm had a store in Soho. This was, you know, at the beginning of the culture becoming more interwoven into society in, you know, fashion and advertising. And you know, it led to the early 2000s where, you know, certain brands were really taking interest. And that was when like, you know, Scion and Red Bull and these people, you know, these brands started to catch on like, wow, this, this certain, you know, these cultures aren't going anywhere. They're very strong and they're full of like spirited, talented people who are so dedicated to the subcultures themselves. So yeah, it was an amazing time in Manhattan then. And one of the nice things, too, about your, your career was that you were a dedicated style writer and, yeah. and a very good one. Um, who was directly influencing you? Was anybody giving you outlines? Who was directly kind of leading you into this? You know, early on, I got a few outlines, and it, I had a, a friend at Bronx Science. That's where I went to school for um, about a year and a half before I dropped out and ended up in, in an alternative school where I had like a little more art 
in my life. But um, so I, I had a few outlines from friends and school. Um, but, you know, honestly, I just I practice constantly um, in my bedroom. And I mean, just just all the time exploring, you know, different ways. You know, how can I make these letters? And, um, you know, I think it's really important for for writers and for, um, you know, for any artist to, to really figure out your own style. It's, it's one thing to gain inspiration, and I do, from um, L.A. writers, actually. I mean, I love New York. In New York, my favorite crews of all time are um, AOK and um, TFB, the Fantastic Partners, uh, TC5, FC, FX, um, and, you know, in terms of bombing, uh, RIS, YKK, XTC, you know, there's so much inspiration. But with that, you have to make it your own. And, you know, that's a journey in itself. So so that's what I've always been doing, because, you know, you don't want to be like a, a writer that that bites. So, you know, right. Like Given the competitive nature of it, uh, yeah. you, you know, you you probably had more pressure to prove yourself, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was always really into what I was doing. So, um, you know, I, I felt pressure more from myself, you know, how can I how can I do this better? How can I get better at letters? And of course, you know, when you're starting out, you look at these big writers, and you're like, Oh, my God, it blows your mind. Like, you know, can I get that good? Like, you know, how can I get there? So it was just a, a constant, you know, process of practicing and, and doing pieces that like, you know, weren't that great, but you know, trying again, and, and you keep it moving. And, and you really have to stay passionate about it and, and keep going. So that's I, like Yeah, I gather, I gather you were well protected given the writers you, you were associated with. So perhaps you didn't have to deal with any chauvinism? Um, I think, you know, it popped up here and there, but again, it's, it's kind of like, if you're, if you're really dedicated, and especially as a woman, you kind of have to just keep doing what you're doing. And, and you might hear it, you know, and, and oh, you're a girl or, or, you know, whatever it is, there are a lot of different things people say, but you have to keep pushing forward, you, you really need to build that, you know, self belief. And, and for me, also, it's because I love the culture so much, you know, graffiti isn't just you know, um, tagging up and doing pieces. It's it's the music. It's the, you know, it's the fashion. It's it's so many different things, and and it's related to other cultures. You know, skateboarding. It's you know, go out there and rock. So, um, you know, I feel like I had a lot of support just because I I loved what I was doing. But yes, I had friends like um like Ket, and um and other friends that looked out for me, and that is very important because you know, people, crews are strong and, you know, crews also have beef with each other. So it can become, you know, a war sometimes. Absolutely. And yeah. It's, it's like a, a gang mentality, you know, very much so in graffiti sometimes, but that's just the way it is. And um, yeah, so I, I feel lucky that I had some good friends like Ket and other people who looked out for me. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the things, Andrea, we, we well, for me anyway, I've been super inspired by uh, the female writers. Uh, uh, you know, and again, I, I, it, some hate that you kind of categorize them as female writers. I mean, you have yeah. to kind of be gender specific to kind of say, hey, there is a, there's something else that happens here outside the, you know, the boys club. And yeah. right now, because uh, we're looking at this Mick QA piece, and she's also a style writer. Yeah. And she'll be joining us soon as well. But I, 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 I am well aware of a whole new genre, a, a generation rather, of female style writers, specifically style writers. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that is really exciting to me because the caliber um, that has been set already by, you know, writers like yourself is so high. Right. And that it, it just blurs the line, you know, and, 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 and I, I've often heard this, you know, that Matt C say this, I want you just to see the art. I don't want you to see the genre, the, the gender rather. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another part of your, your au revoir, let's say, are the trucks. Uh, are you in Wayne in competition as to how many trucks you guys can paint? Because man, you guys are killing no. it. No, not and, at all. And, and actually the way I got involved with, uh, the trucks was through cash, through uh, Cash RFC 
And also, you know, RFC crew was very, very important downtown back in the day. I mean, these guys like ran, you know, downtown, you know, in some parts. So, um, so big ups to that crew for sure. So I got onto a truck with, um, with cash and then I was invited by both of them to, to rock on some, cr on some, uh, trucks which was really a huge honor because they were just, you know, slaying in the city for a while. So that was really amazing. But, you know, Cash calls the trucks, it's like a modern day whole car. So, you know, we don't have trains anymore, but we have these like cool box trucks that that roll around the city and it's it's kind of the same thing. It's it's um it's it's good fame, you know, they go all over the place. And um, yeah, that's been that's been great. It's been really fun. And it's a huge honor because a writer like Wayne, like these are writers that, you know, inspired me from day one. And um, it's it's just been great to collaborate with them. How do you go about getting these trucks? Um, I mean, some of them I've gotten on my own. You you really it's it's kind of like the nature of the hustle. You, you got to go up and talk to them and, and, you know, let them know, hey, I, I you know, I'm an artist, I do this thing. And, and sometimes they, they see that it's graffiti and they kind of relate to it because it's urban and they're like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, you have to, it's, it's like a client relationship in some way, but, but not really. And, um, you know, you just figure out where they're going to park it and, and you go rock. You know, I, I think it's a nice way, though, to, to keep, um, you know, at least traffic looking like colorful and urban and you know adding some some graffiti we don't have it on trains anymore so you know god bless all of the people who paint trucks because i think it it really adds a lot it's i i would agree with you because it's always a, a a great surprise and a pleasure when i'm driving in the city and one of these things pull up on me yeah. a masterpiece yeah on a yeah box. I, well, one of the things that I've come to appreciate about the, the paintings, particularly yours, is the clarity of the message, right? Uh, especially on the trucks, because you could actually read it no matter how fast it's going or no matter how far it is, right? As opposed to a wild style. And again, this goes back to your skill sets as a typographer. But also, you know, what's really cool, it's, it's your messaging. And, and you've been kind of playing with kind of hip hop culture words. Uh, and phrases in your work, uh, wh wh why why use or repurpose these words in 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 typography large scale? You know, I made a, a deliberate decision at one point to focus on messaging a little bit more, and the reason why was because I got a little bored of you know just doing my name constantly. And you know, it's great that there are some writers that do different names, so it's like different pieces. Wayne does that, you know, and that's amazing. But I wanted to 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 bring something else, you know, to life. And I love hip hop. You know, phrasing words are so important. They can be incredibly empowering. They can be very disempowering. Language really is um, is so important for us. So I wanted to find a way to do something new, and and to challenge myself to to sort of keep learning and and you know figure out like you know how can i do what i do but you know say something else and and some of them relate to city life they re relate to the the hustle the the struggle that that you know we're all in basically and um you know like this piece for example bright lights big city like that's the big up to our to the city and to to new yorkers and to to people, you know, living that hustle. So it's a way for me to, you know, express new things, given the skills that I, you know, learned when I was so young, just, you know, writing my name. Yeah, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a familiarity in it for me in terms of traditional New York advertising, going yeah. back to, I guess, the 30s and 40s, all you know, inside of buildings, all the, all the, the, the murals, all the, the signage, painting that was going on uh, and also you know with bodegas right we grew up with bodegas yeah. and it's constant you know bright advertising um, but one of the things I also love is you've kind of started owning this term hustle hard yeah. 
yeah. which, it, which really represents you because you are a hard hustler uh, in your work and in your art. Um, I, how did you uh, adopt this title, this word for yourself? I, I can't remember where I first heard it. It was probably in a song, um, Ace Hook has a really good song, Hustle Hard. And, um, you know, it really represents the struggle. It's like, you know, who isn't hustling hard every day? You know, it's interesting what's going on now has made us kind of have to scale back in so many ways and, and see our hustle in a different way. But, but we're always hustling on something. And it's really, it's an ode to that, you know, it's kind of honoring like how hard we work or, you know, how hard a, a writer works to get up or how hard a, an artist works, you know, to get their message across anything, like how hard a mother works to, um, you know, to take care of the kids. It's, it really is, is a motivation. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's really just more relates to hip hop and, and cause I love hip hop and um, that, you know, hustle hard for me, just, just more relates to that. So, yeah, and another thing that I've noticed is, is that you've also established a color palette for yourself. It seems is is that correct? Is yeah. there's a theme? There's a theme going on with your murals. I I prefer the the super bright colors. I think that they're you know very uplifting. Color is also an incredible tool that that we use as artists and. You know, there are artists who focus on that exclusively, like uh, Rothko, um, you know, just color fields in themselves can be very powerful. So I tend to to use, you know, bright, happy colors. Maybe it, it's just what I like. But, you know, also as a woman doing this, I have also, you know, it's kind of to attract a little bit more attention because unfortunately, you know, as a woman, it, it can be a boys club in in the art world so you know i i use color to to highlight my message and to uh you know to emphasize things and i just love color um you know my clothes and my my kicks i have a, a whole collection of of colors that are super bright so you know it, it's just really my life and um and people seem to really like it you know, color is a is a huge thing. There's color therapy. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it can it can really be good for people. So beyond just you know using it, you know, in murals and graph, it, it's it's really important. I I would agree with you because it, there's something about, um, and I've seen this. I've actually seen this when people come up to your walls and and they they decide to choose what part of the wall they want to stand by because of the color. Yeah, you're right. They, they're they probably gravitating to certain colors. Like, you know, blue can be relaxing. There's a whole psychology, like, you know, subway, um, in subway cars, the seats are shades of orange for a reason. It's actually, you know, people respond to different colors. So that's a, a really nice aspect of, of my work that I, that I love exploring different colors. This one piece that we're looking at now, the Bowery Wall, believe and love more. I, well, there are a couple of things that I, I want to point out. One, again, the clarity and the message, uh, the optimism, uh, the positivity in it, uh, but, but also in terms of design, uh, how really it's, it's, you know, some kind of 80s vibe <laughs> to it, um, a bit of Italian Memphis style even, and that uh, it's so striking. And again, your work is, is, is is done in a way is painted in a way that it's so approachable um, and it's also um, something that you can really connect to from a distance yeah um, you know I, I take all of that into consideration this particular wall the um, the location is so important uh, Houston and Bowery is like um, it's kind of an epicenter <laughs> of, uh, of downtown so I, I did carefully consider what I was going to paint there and actually believe the phrase was just something I had been playing with in my studio. And for the time, I think that it was relevant and it was important. For me, it was really a call to, for people to, you know, think about what they believe to, you know, what empowers 
how important belief is, believing in yourself, believing in positivity and change. You know, we we need to consider like, you know, how important that is. And the um, the love more part, I painted a little bit closer to the sidewalk so people could, you know, take selfies and and it would be a nice reminder of of that power to to love more in your daily life. So and the rest is is this, you know, cool 80s vibe that I love. Um, retro fun uh, geometry and color fields. So I, I feel like the the wall was was really special for me because of the location. I mean, I grew up in that neighborhood. So yeah. returning, you know, to it to paint this epic mural was um, was really important to to do the art, but also just to be there, you know, where where I grew up and, you know, all the things that we used to do there and, and all the other things that happened there, you know, Houston Street used to be like, completely bombed. And, you know, there were writers that were just, you know, epically, like, tearing up the city, uh, you know, with vandalism. And I think that's pretty cool. So, um, so this was my way of, of, you know, being a part of it and, you know, using my skills that I learned, you know, very early on to, uh, you know, just to splash this, this message onto the wall. As you were painting it, obviously there's a lot of passer people passing by. What, what kind of response were you getting? Um, I was getting a pretty positive response. Um, it's always a mixed bag in New York. Uh, there are a lot of locals there who are, you know, very interested. You know, what's the next mural? Because it's a rotating uh, mural. So, you know, you get some positive ones and, and you know, you get haters always. You know, that's the thing about working in the street, which I which I learned early on, you really have to know how to handle yourself with, um, you know, what people are saying and how they're reacting and and, you know, know how to respond in a constructive way. You you really need to have a thick skin um, and you know, even more so when you're doing illegal work. I mean, that's the ultimate. You really, you know, <laughs> you've got to be strong out there. So um <laughs> How, how attached are you to this work? You know, if somebody goes over it, um, how, how emotionally are you attached? Oh, God, that's the worst, man. Like that, you know, to me, it's like, you know, it's like a stab in the heart. It's, it's really tough because, you know, you spend so much time learning this. And, you know, it, it's more than just one piece. <laughs> you know, I think that's why people go crazy. And, and, you know, wars start because, you know, it's not just me, it's my crew and, you know, that's my spot. And, and so, of course, there's a, there's a level of territorialism that happens and that's just natural, you know, that's been embedded in the culture since day one. So, but, you know, it's important to realize that, you know, there are haters out there and, and you need to sort of like handle yourself and, and learn how to fend that off and, and, you know, not, you know, just like not attract that. But um, yeah, like I, I hate it. So, you know, I, I always go fix my my pieces if something happens and, you know, like sort of draw hard lines so I can hard line stance. So I, I, I run in the street, <laughs> you know, you have to. Yes, of course. And, and again, going back to the clarity and the message, which I like, I saw this image <laughs> And it's for me, it's powerful because of the young girl in front of it, but also because of the, the typography set behind her that says, because I choose to use my infinite potential. And uh, that's wonderful <laughs> that this young girl sits in front of it because who knows, maybe she'll be inspired by you, right? Inspired to be creative, to be an artist. Yeah, that that is a really important lyric for me. And actually it comes from a, a really raw, song it's the j rue the damage song and it's it's super raw i mean this is like you know straight up you know rap and and you know i made it look pretty um but this was back in 2012 that was about eight years ago i was just starting to explore you know these different these different messages and what's interesting is um queens big queensbridge projects are a couple blocks away and so a lot of kids walk down that street and they would stop and try and figure out what the mural said. 
And as they were saying it, they're talking about, you know, their own infinite potential. And it was so heartwarming that, you know, people would say this, you know, these words. And I hope that it was, you know, it somehow inspiring for, for kids. Yeah. Right. I, I, again, you know, the clarity in the message is so, so important. And, and that's one of the things I remember when uh, on some of the trains, particularly with Lee, he was really smart about having clarity in his messages so that when you see something going by really fast, you could absorb it. Uh, same thing here. Like if you're in a car driving by, you could actually take in the message. Uh, and, and like I said, generally what's really nice is you're, you're painting positive messages. Um, that leads us into this project. I, I want to know more about uh, the project you were doing at Rikers Island uh, prison facility. So for Rikers Island, I um, got a commission to paint um, about, I think it was about 20 different sites. And these are in the visit facilities. So this is where inmates meet with their lawyers, with their families, with their children, you know, with anyone that wants to visit them. And if anyone's been in the prison system, it's, um, you know, it's really rough. And it's also, you know, we need a lot of criminal justice reform. So people stay stuck in there, whatever. I'm not going to go into that. But, you know, this was a way to bring hope to, um, to the inmates and to their families and humanize the situation and, you know, to beautify it a bit. You know, hope plays a big part, I think, in, in many aspects of our, of our lives. And it's needed, especially for, you know, you're doing time, but, you, you know, you want to get out, see the light at the end of the tunnel. So this has been a really great project. Um, I've painted a lot more there, but the images don't get released. So I'm, I'm not able to share a lot of them. But it's very important work for me. Um, at most of the sites, I work with inmates directly. And I, um, you know, some of them are painters already, or they want to learn more. And any, did you meet any writers? <laughs> no, I, I didn't meet any writers. But, uh, but I, I, I met a lot of, you know, other guys and, and heard their stories and women. Um, so I also worked at Rosie's, which is a facility for women. Um, and it was really great to connect with them, you know, doing these painting projects are, it's a time where they can open up a little bit, they can be creative, it's therapeutic, and they're, you know, contributing to beautifying part of their own jail facility. So it has a lot of meaning for me in a lot of ways, but it's not easy work. I mean, this is, this is not glamorous. It's, um, you know, there's no Starbucks, there's no, you know, VIP treatment. And I think as an artist, it's important to, you know, do your craft, you know, wherever you can and be humble enough to do it in places that, you know, are not fancy <laughs> and, um, and bougie in any way. So, yeah, it's, it's an important project for me. I, I really like that it creates change like that. I, I appreciate that, I, and I, I want to take a moment to welcome everybody who's just joining us. We are with Queen Andrea discussing her work. Um, and Andrea, this, is the, this part we're going to get into is your evolution, right? And the refinement of the artist, uh, the, the uh, awareness of the value of your art, the impact of your art, not just on community, but as a professional. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I like about you is that you started super fresh design mm -hmm. and it, it's it's wonderful we talked about this earlier about uh owning your own identity your own uh, uh aesthetic uh and also you know this this in itself is is in in your story for any of the young people or the artists that are are listening um it, it's a really important lesson for us in terms of uh, taking it upon ourselves to develop professionally and get not just credibility professionally to be well paid for it as well. And so part of this, I want you to tell us more about why you started Super Fresh Design and what was what kind of outcomes were you having? You know, actually, Super Fresh Design, I started like in my last year of college. You know, I bought the URL. I had no idea what I was doing, but I thought the URL sounded cool. 
And, um, <laughs> you know, I guess I'm lucky to get it because I, a bunch of people have wanted to buy that particular name. Um, but it's, um, it's an umbrella for a lot of other projects that I do. And, you know, I went to school for graphic design, for communication design at Parsons. Um, and, you know, it, after I graduated in the early 2000s, I was working consistently as a graphic designer. So that gave me a nice, you know, when I wasn't working on stuff that was corporate or, you know, totally unrelated to my early days as a graffiti writer and sort of just urban illustrator, um, I started to incorporate what I, you know, do in the street and just this passion for, um, you know, more urban uh, styles into my work. And I ended up um, not under super fresh design, but as a graphic designer working for places like Mass Appeal, where I was the art director for two years and um, other places like Rockaware. I was there for a while, uh, Universal Music Group, working on Lil Wayne's brand. So it was a really awesome way to evolve what I was doing into, you know, more commercial settings without, you know, being a sellout, you know, just urban fashion and, and urban illustration styles are important. So, so, so that was really great. And, um, and then as time moved on, super fresh design has become a larger umbrella for um, bigger projects, you know, larger branding projects that include um, murals plus, you know, logo development, branding, you know, different aspects of a visual communication, you know, for clients and, and people to express their, their brand. Yeah, for instance, and, and we're watching this clip from your, your project with City Bike, uh, which was a fantastic project. It was a pretty, pretty big project for you, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a pretty big project. Um, it was incorporated into the House and Bowery mural. So some of the artwork that I did there was on posters at kiosks, um, City, Bank, uh, City Bike kiosks, and... Um, it had the believe message and love more all over the bike. So, so that was really great. Um, there were a lot of different things that went into that. Um, it was a lot of branding, a lot of considerations of, um, you know, what do New Yorkers like, you know, how is this going to be received? Uh, so I, I really had to be careful with, um, you know, what I was putting out there and which everyone should do, I think. Do you see this at, like I do as just when we're working with corporate clients uh, in these big commercial projects that it's just another form of getting up big time and on somebody else's dime as well? I do. I do see it like that because, you know, if we stay true to who we are and, you know, how we started, basically we're just, you know, kind of experts in urban life and, you know, from our own perspective, you know, some of us have a, a, a greater audience, you know, someone like Alan Kett, like has been doing that for a long time when he had, you know, Stress Magazine. And, you know, so we're, we're kind of contributing and creating from our own experience, you know, new things for these, you know, clients. So I don't think it's selling out. I think it's actually, you know, adding more when you use your um, your skills and your experience in this realm, and um, you know you give it a greater voice. I, I think it's very important. Certainly, there are ways that people you know sell out, and and you know it's unfortunate. But you know when you stay true to yourself and you're just like sharing it um, and you know doing it in the right way, I and being authentic about it, I think it's it's great. Yeah, I, I think there's also no, another part of this is, uh, I think as a viewer, as somebody of the culture, when you see uh, somebody you know doing these big commercial projects, it's so exciting. I know for me, every time someone does a, a, a commercial project, and it doesn't even need to have graffiti or urban, ex you know, it's kind of celebrating ourselves that, that we are actually uh, mobilized and also kind of trying to uh, a, a, adapt to a, the economy of art, right? Um, right. 
but also yeah. that there is a need. There is a need for your aesthetic, uh, like we see here for this. This this is like a big come up to have a big yeah. billboard on Seventh Avenue. Yeah, that was that was quite big. That was for uh, Vulture Magazine, not not Vulture Magazine, New York Magazine, Vulture Festival, and. Um, yeah, the the billboards were really big. I did different typography and backgrounds, and I brought an urban flair to the entire thing. Um, some of them were, these were actually printed, so I just did digital illustration. But yeah, I totally brought an authentic flavor of typography um, in a, a very urban look in a, in a, you know, genuine way to, uh, to the festival. So, I, I mean... That's why I think people like, you know, us are important, especially um, pioneers like you and, and, and other cats, because, you know, we know the history so well, and we, you know, actually do it. So, you know, we're the perfect people to, you know, bring our flavor to these um, different projects and, you know, corporate clients and events and campaigns you know, whatever it is, you, you really need that authentic experience to, to bring to these projects. Right. And you have to advocate for yourself. One of the things I learned early on when I was in ad working with advertising agencies and these commercial projects is that, you know, that I wouldn't be treated as just another studio employee, that I was already an established brand or name. Right. And again, this is the one thing that I like about this particular project is that, again, they, they showcase you. Uh, yeah. normally that's not normally the case is it it agencies just do agency work they don't single anyone out yeah exactly so I, I was very happy about that and actually I wasn't expecting it and when that happened I was like great you know thank you for uh, you know putting me on and recognizing that you know I'm not just some illustrator that you hired to you know make it look urban <laughs> you know I've actually kind of been there done that and so so that was great i i was very grateful that they actually included my name and highlighted it and presented it yeah uh, another one of your projects a public project this is really interesting i've never seen this one before uh tell me about this commission so this was for the um the department of transportation uh the new with New York City has a mural program and they started it I think in 2009 so they have open calls for uh, for different sites that could be painted you know revamped beautified um, and so you know you you have to do an application you you're competing against other artists of course um, so I, I got this commission um, but actually, the entire mural program hasn't been around for very long, and it, and it's you know taken them a lot to to fight for their own artistic vision within the you know New York City um, agency structures, which aren't always so open to art. So I'm really happy that they exist in the first place. Yeah. Um, so I got this commission, and it took about maybe two and a half to three weeks to paint. Um, I mean, these projects are insane. It's so much work. It's, you know, not just painting, it's logistics. And, you know, you have to hire um, amazing teams. You have to mentor younger artists. There are a lot of different um, logistical details every single day that you have to deal with. You've got to be really organized, um, you know, have a production schedule, a stay on schedule. So, so these are really huge projects that that I love, you know, working on. They're this one in particular. Tell me about this one because the, this is a huge project. We're looking at a picture of the the Bonnaroo uh, Festival. Yeah, so that's actually a fountain, and um, the festival itself takes place in Tennessee. So it's like super hot during the summer, and for like the thousands of people, you know, roaming around the grounds they have nowhere to cool off but this fountain. So, you know, the entire floor is painted. So like where I'm standing there, you know, water is coming out and, and they're standing on the art. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's like a, a functional art installation. Yeah, and it's it, lovely. Yeah, it took really a, a while to, to paint and there are also thunderstorms rolling through. So, 
you know, normally if there's rain and you're painting a mural on a wall, like you can dodge it, you know, you can figure out a way, but not on a ground mural. So, no. you know, I had traveled out there and it's like, you know, so a lot of times with these projects, you're kind of like, you're, it's constant problem solving. You have to be, you know, really on your toes and, and resourceful and, you know, figure out, you know, ways to make it happen. One of the things I want to bring you back indoors, because one of the things I wanted to highlight uh, is also that you're a logo designer. You're a very good, solid uh, uh, graphic designer. I mean, outside of what we've been seeing in your work, you have a, kind of an old school discipline uh, yeah. for, for logo design. Uh, and so that's another another thing people should be aware of is, is that, you know, yes, the, the work can be very rich and colorful and exciting. Uh, but again, you have a strong uh, skill set in terms of logo design. Yeah, I mean, and that comes from uh, some of my training in college. And, you know, I, I had a branding class, branding, logo, identity, you know. But I kind of made it my own because I ended up working for these urban brands. And actually, there are two logos on the side there that were for Rockaware. It was a, a brand within a brand called uh, Black Kings. And I worked with um, a graffiti writer, George Robles, um, Gets TC5. He was my creative director. So, you know, again, from the culture, and he's brilliant. So, you know, sometimes at these jobs, at you know, with these different clients, I've worked with other people that are from the culture. And there are a lot of them um, who are, you know, very established and from the graffiti world. So, you know, that's really important. Yeah, and you stay within the vernacular and the, and the work, which is really cool. I, yeah. I think that's something I'm, I, I feel that way. I'm more comfortable sometimes with, with projects that are in the vernacular. Yeah, exactly. So if it's, you know, something that you're not familiar with, you know, a Midwestern sort of vibe or you know, you might not really resonate with it, but it's if it's urban or, you know, it relates to our culture, it's much easier for us to, you know, understand the vibe and, and bring forth, you know, our, our, you know, visual knowledge. Right. And I, I, I'm stopping here at the slide of the ABCs of Style, which is uh, the book that Chino published. And uh, it's fantastic because it brought it together a lot of you guys, uh, well-known style writers, uh, to contribute a letter. And of course, you contributed to Q. Uh, tell me about this project and, and uh, your participation in it. Oh, gosh, this was a huge honor. So this was with Testify Books. And um, it was curated uh, with Dana and also Chino, uh, Chino BYI, who is amazing. Um, and they chose, I guess, 26 different artists for each letter of the alphabet. It was a huge honor. I mean, Cause did one of them. So I was just totally thrilled. It's it's amazing company and it's great for kids because I mean, they get a firsthand knowledge of um, letters from, you know, graffiti writers interpreting them. And also it's amazing because um, I think it was in this book, they also did it in Peace Book where you see the bleed through on the page. Yeah. You know, on the back of the page. So it's like very inventive and um, yeah, it's, it's it, really- this is, this is one of the books that it, at the museum, that, at our shop, this is the one that sells out quite a lot. Uh, yeah. You'd be surprised how many parents uh, give, give this book to their kids. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's kid friendly, it really is. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's wonderful. And it's great for kids to see like, you know, people who are, are really well known um, interpreting letters in an urban way. Um, it's just fantastic. Another recent project of yours this December uh, was with Drew and, and uh, the, the, you know, the cigar, the Acid Cigar Project, which is a fantastic project. Yeah. So you, those, you've been very busy. I, you, yeah. You stay busy. I stay pretty busy, yeah, thankfully. Um, you know what, and if I'm if I'm not busy, I just try and make projects to to be busy on my own. <laughs> you know, I mean, in the early days when I was writing graffiti and and you know, that's the story of a lot of writers, you just go out and do it. 
So, um, so, you know, I'm always trying to make something happen. And yeah, this particular project was great. It's an amazing team over there. And they actually started in Brooklyn. So we did this photo shoot um, and a video shoot, but you know, with the Brooklyn Bridge as a backdrop. I was in great company. I was the only woman, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, but that's great, you know, that, that I was representing. And um, yeah, it, it was really awesome. We did some amazing art and I'm really grateful to be a part of it. It was their 20 year anniversary. And we created these mini water towers that are decorated with our art and their um, point of purchase displays that are in stores like across the, the US. Yeah, the brilliant idea really is. Yeah. So, so Andrea, I have a question for you because you know, we are in very interesting times, so to speak. And for many of us artists, we, we're trying to figure out ways to cope, to understand the changes, both in our communities, in our practice, uh, and with our clients. And um, I always ask everybody towards the end of our conversation, how are you doing, toward, you know, d dealing with and coping with uh, co Corona in New York City, which was hard hit. Um, but I know that doesn't stop you. Uh, it hasn't stopped you. Tell us about what you've been up to. Well, honestly, it was like hard to just first face the slowdown because, oh. you know, I, I had a lot of projects in the mix. I was supposed to be back in Spain working on something and, you know, a few other projects and everything stops. And you're sort of like, there was a momentum that was going and it just, you know, completely ceases. So first getting used to that and then realizing, well, you know what, I'm going to use, you know, my creativity now to sort of voice what I'm feeling. And, you know, I was feeling resilience, you know, the need for us to, to really, we, we all have to be more resilient and, and strong right now. And, you know, also our communities have become more important. You know, right now we have like the, the feds bailing people out, you know, and sending us checks. But it's like, you know, we need more resourcefulness, sustainability communities. So, you know, that's become, I think, very important and uh, a really, uh, you know, important takeaway from this situation. So I've honestly just been designing typography. I, I tend to, you know, always you know, work with letters and phrases. And, and that's what I've always done. I, I love hip hop, I love lyrics, and, you know, different, um, you know, songs that that make me feel inspired. So I, I've just been continuing to do that. And I have a new um, campaign, We Love New York. Um, it's really about the love in any city, you know, the love in the city and our communities and relying on each other, what's really important. Um, so I'm right now doing more of that. I have, you know, some different sites planned that I'll be spreading this message. So, you know, that's been really important for me. I, I love New York so much and it, it's really difficult, you know, that we're going through this, but we have to be resourceful and, you know, like communicate in ways where we support each other. So that's, that's the point of, of this new art. Yeah, and that's what I appreciate about the clarity and the message. Um, I've got a couple questions already for you. And uh, Allison asked, have you been making fine art for gallery shows? Yeah, of course. I've been, I've been doing that. And um, I was in Spain in uh, February at an amazing art fair called Urvanity. Um, I had a bunch of paintings there, you know, and prints, and I was selling my work. So I have a studio practice, you know, mm -hmm. always going. I have this one um, that I recently finished. But, um, you know, I, yeah, so I have that in the works. I, I do a lot of different things, and sometimes I, I'm in the street painting more than I should be in my studio. So, you know, I'm trying to do it all. But I definitely have a lot that I'm working on in the studio. I love it. So folks out there in our final minutes, if you have any questions for QA, Queen Andrea, please submit them uh, while we have her. Uh, okay, so Sarah uh, Yermick asks, who's your favorite writer at the moment? Gosh, you know, actually my favorite writer that I'm thinking about is uh, Kez Five. And he- recently Yes, rest in peace. He recently passed away. And, um, you know, I, he, I met him really early on in the- uh, 
the early 90s and man that guy was one of the realest <laughs> of the real like you know sometimes the hate is real too and you know graffiti it, it can be like that but you know his passion to the game was really undeniable and so I, I really am thinking about Nestor and I, I'm hoping that he, you know, rests in peace with a few other writers that we've lost at this time um, and recently. So, you know, that's very important for me. It's, it's um, it, yeah, I, I really honor his memory. Uh, Tree Home asks, what, what's your word on bombers going over street art? I mean, it's kind of bullshit, you know, to be disrespectful in that way, but it is also kind of the way it is. There's a brashness that comes with vandalism and bombing that, you know, you just want to paint anything and everything. And, and really that's the way it goes. Um, you know, back when we were all doing that in the, well, when I was doing it in the early nineties and when, you know, in the 80s, um, there wasn't as much uh, street art in terms of these super intricate murals. So that's something new we have on the street. So, of course, like, you know, there's going to be a, a bit of, um, you know, uh, just difficulty between the two parts. Yeah, I, I find I find that the lines blur because yeah. writers themselves have a tremendous creative capacity to do murals. Uh, outside of just letters and it, it you know uh, many of my friends and our friends are are so talented they play both sides of the fence equally yeah. and we have to get a, used to that and adapt to that and and of course it, it's an ongoing debate about legitimacy between street art and graffiti you can pick and choose your battles i suppose uh but it's important to understand that there are many great style writers that can do the most amazing mural without any type of lettering style in them. Yeah. Uh, I have another question for you. Um, let me go back to it. Um, have you ever been caught, arrested? Any Vandal Squad stories? Um, no Vandal Squad stories, but I've been, you know, chased like, you know, really bad uh, quite a few times. So, yeah. you know, luckily we got away and, you know, that was one thing that I decided early on, actually, like I had been hanging out with Kez Five and other YKK writers in the early 90s. And I, I realized, you know, firsthand that it was a, a pretty rough lifestyle. Yeah, and I'm Andrea, I'm going to I'm going to hold you on that because we got 40 seconds remaining. OK. And I want to thank you sincerely from everyone that joined us today and, and from the museum. Uh, we really thank appreciate you. we could go on forever with you, I'm sure. But thank you so much for sharing your <laughs> art, your journey. And we're looking forward to what's next. Awesome. Awesome. Me too. And much love to all you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Museum of Graffiti. I love you yes. guys. And yeah, we'll talk soon. We'll, we'll be back here tomorrow with Jim Prigoff. So okay. stay tuned. And again, thank you for your amazing art and your, and your stories. Uh, and again, anyone who's interested, go to her Instagram or her website and you'll learn more. And of course, there's plenty of material on you. You Google you and it's wow.